Good evening, Brian, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi number 337 and our lockdown lecture series, meeting number 67. As ever, Brian, it's a great pleasure to welcome you along to our virtual Zoom meetings uh, on this fine Tuesday evening. Uh, as ever, Brian, can I remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidance for Zoom meetings? Please can you ensure that your camera remains on? If you do have bandwidth challenges, Brian, just drop me a little message in the chat box. I won't reply, but at least I know it's there. I can see it and I've read it, Brian. As ever, can I ask you to sign our virtual tile on our Facebook pages? And if you've not already joined our Facebook pages, Brian, please search for it, the Lodge Hope of Cratchy and join in the conversation there that happens most days. Thank you very much. That would be much appreciated. Well, Brian, uh, it's a great delight to bring a, a new uh, speaker to our lockdown lecture series. Right, worshipful brother, Donny Higginbotham, uh, from uh, the state of Oklahoma, over in the US of A. Uh, Donny tells me he's a past Grand High Priest and past Grand Commander uh, of Oklahoma. He's a, a past master of Roth 169 and the Oklahoma Lodge of Research. And that's where I found Donnie's name and that he is a, an experienced speaker, Bern. Uh, he served on the Technology and Education Committees for the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma. And he's a student of Oklahoma and the Indian Territory Masonic history. And this evening, Bern, we've been honoured with the first outing of his new lecture on that said subject, the history of the Grand Lodge of the Indian Territory and the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma. So, worshipful brother Donny Higginbottom, welcome to the Lockdown Lecture Series and the virtual floor is yours, sir. Brother, and thank you for having me. And it's quite a pleasure. Uh, brother Kerr, uh, at the end of this lecture, I'd like to give you a little bit of information about how your name is extremely famous and not only Oklahoma history, but the history of the United States. So uh, after, after this lecture, we'll, we'll talk a little bit. In 1832, most worshipful brother, Andrew Jackson was elected president of the United States. He had a problem the, at, the, at that time period in Eastern United States, it was after the Louisiana Purchase and all. At that time period, they were trying to get all of the Native Americans out and across the Mississippi. They wanted to have basically not, no one of Native ancestry back, uh, left in that section. The, the Natives, we, call, we called them tribes, but in reality, they were nations. They even had geographical boundaries. And in some of the nations would share lands with other nations. Uh, give you an example, the Cherokee tribe, which was one of the largest tribes in the South and East of the United States, shared the state of, what is now the state of Kentucky with the Shawnee tribe for hunting grounds. No tribes actually lived in what is now the state of Kentucky but it was the hunting grounds of the Cherokee and the Shawnee. The Chickasaw, which I live in the nation, the Chickasaw Nation in, in Oklahoma, shared their, their lands, part of their lands with the Chickasaw tribe, which they are considered sister tribes, having a, the same root. The, it was two brothers that formed two tribes. So, the Chickasaws and the Choctaw are one tribe that's split in two, basically, but they are independent nations. And in 1832, there was a court case called Worcester versus Georgia, which was is 2021 is still echoing through the through the through history. Uh, it's created some incidences that are going on in Oklahoma. But basically what it said is that no state had jurisdiction over any member of the, of the nation of India, the, any of the Indian nations. And if there's any questions later on this, I'll explain how that still echoes to this day. Uh, but most worshipful Jackson decided to, he passed what was called the Indian Removal Act. And the Indian Removal Act 
was ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court, ruled over by most worshipful brother, John Marshall, who was past grandmaster of Virginia. Andrew Jackson was past grandmaster of Tennessee. And when uh, Worcester versus Georgia came out, Brother Jackson is most notably quoted as saying, well, Mr. Marshall has made his ruling, let him enforce it. And he proceeded to start rounding up the Native Americans and moving them to what is now Oklahoma. The, um, the trip was called the Trail of Tears. And it was called the Trail of Tears because there was bodies left the whole way. Old people, young people, babies, middle-aged. About 5,000 people died just from the Cherokee tribe on the Trail of Tears. The principal chief of the Cherokee tribe at that time was worshipful brother, John Ross, who was a member of a lot that we, we've been able to document that he received his degrees in Washington, D.C., but we haven't been, haven't, I haven't seen the documentation about which lodge he received his degrees in. Worshipful Brother Ross was a leader of men. Uh, he was one of the ones that brought the case, Worcester v. Georgia, to the Supreme Court. He tried to fight everything legally, lawfully. And unfortunately, even though he, he won the battle, he lost the war. Well, now the Native Americans are being resettled. There was five primary tribes. We call them the five civilized tribes. There were the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Cherokee, and the Creek, and the Seminole. And they were settled in what is now Oklahoma Territory, but back then it was called Indian Territory. And unless you were married in, you weren't allowed, basically allowed into the, into the territory. Unless you had business or if you lived there, you had to be married into, the, into one of the nations. How many of y'all have heard of the, saw the movie True Grit with John Wayne? Uh, True Grit is, while it's fiction, it's based upon reality. Fort Smith, Arkansas was the judicial base for Indian Territory. And the federal judge uh, would send in marshals to arrest and bring in fugitives. Outlaws would hang out in Indian territory. Matter of fact, my great grandpa was one of those outlaws. He, uh, he come into, to, from Texas into uh, Chickasaw country where he settled in. And uh, uh, he was uh, running from the law in Texas to be blunt. Um, there was um, several good men who are these marshals. Several of them died. They went uh, in combat in, in the history. But what does this have to do with masonry? It all goes back to John Ross. John Ross, when he came into Oklahoma, Indian Territory, helped found the very first lodge in, the, in Indian Territory called Cherokee Lodge. And it was founded in a, the capital city of the Cherokee, which was Tahlequah. He was the first secretary of the lodge and he was also one of the early masters of the lodge. As things settled through the years, more and more lodges were, were founded and there were, we got up to six lodges. And after, during the Civil War, let me back up a little bit. Like I say, folks, this is the first time I'm doing this speech. During the Civil War, many of the lodges went dark. Indian Territory, through brother Ad, uh, Albert Pike, I'm sure y'all have heard of that gentleman, came to Indian territory and they created territory, uh, treaties with the various nations that if they fought for the Confederacy and once the Confederacy won, they would be allowed to return home to their lands back across the Mississippi. There were still loyalists who fought for the Union but the majority of the nations fought for the Confederacy, led by General Albert Pike. 
Albert Pike's Indian agent was a, a, a Baptist missionary by the name of, we called him Father Murrow. And he'll become more important here in just a few moments. Many of the lodges went dark during the war, had their charters revoked, so that after the end of the war, there were six lodges left. Flint Lodge number 74, Oklahoma Lodge number 217, Muskogee Lodge number 90, Dokesville Lodge number 279, and Caddo Lodge number 311, which were all chartered by the Grand Lodge of Arkansas. Alpha Lodge, which was the lodge in Tahlequah, which was John Ross's lodge, Number 122 was chartered by Kansas. <clears throat> in 1873, it was decided there was enough lodges in the state to form a Grand Lodge. The, um, the call went out by a gentleman from Caddo Lodge by the name of uh, Granville McPherson, requesting that all the lodges meet and form a new Grand Lodge of Indian Territory. Father Murrow, who was the secretary of Oklahoma Lodge in what is now Atoka, Oklahoma, come up and said, no, no, it's, it's too early. Alpha Lodge agreed. The Grand Lodge of Kansas was flat out against the idea. And Flint Lodge, none of those three showed up for the formation of the Grand Lodge of Indian Territory. But on October 5th, 1873, Granville McPherson was elected the very first Grand Master of Indian Territory. He was an Arkansas Mason who had moved into Indian Territory and established a, um, a newspaper in a little town at what is now Caddo. Caddo is a town, um, more of a village now. It's probably 500 people, but they still have a thriving lodge. Out of all of the lodges that formed the Grand Lodge, Dokesville is the only one that went dark. And Dokesville has a, um, besides no longer existing, even as a town, has a distinct, uh, has a distinction that the last of the Confederates, which were the, uh, the Chickasaws and the Cherokees, surrendered at Dokesville Lodge to the, to the Union. So that was the uh, final finish of the American Civil War. Granville McPherson served his terms as Grand Master. And during this time, Father Murrell had written letters to Arkansas, to the Grand Lodge of Arkansas, throwing a fit about this new te Indian Territory Grand Lodge. What's going on? Why, why are you allowing this? He received no response from the Grand Master. Receiving no response, he decided, well, if they don't care, I don't care. And a Toka Lodge, was Oklahoma Lodge was represented by Father Murrow at the next grand sessions where Father Murrow was elected to be the new Grand Master. Why do we call him Father Murrow? He was a Baptist missionary assigned to the Chicks, Cher, uh, Choctaw. And everywhere he went, he would establish a Baptist church. He would establish a Masonic Lodge. He would establish a chapter of Royal Arch Masons, and he would establish a chapter of the Order of Eastern Star. Every, uh, even my little, little lodge of Roth, Oklahoma, which has 38 members, at one time had a chapter of Royal Arch Masons that was, was established by Father Murrow. So by him going out and doing all of this, he became what is known as the father of, of of Indian, of Oklahoma masonry. He was from Alfreda, Georgia, and he was the second Grand Master. After he retired as Grand Master, he became Grand Secretary, and he was Grand Secretary all the way up through even the state of Oklahoma, uh, which was founded in 1909. In 1892, it was decided that since Oklahoma Indian Territory had been split into two, it's now Indian Territory and Oklahoma Territory, that Oklahoma Territory should have 
its own Grand Lodge. And the Grand Lodge of Indian Territory did all of the background work, getting the Grand Lodge, helping get the Grand Lodge established and called the meeting. On November 10th, 1892, Brother August, August J. Spriggle was elected the first Grand Master of the Oklahoma Territory. So now this one large territory broken to has two Grand Lodges. Well, in 1907, this become an issue. November 7th, 1907, Teddy, Brother Teddy Roosevelt, once again, past master, uh, signed the enabling legislation, which created the two territories, made one state, and Oklahoma became a state in the Union. Under Masonic tradition in the United States, only one Grand Lodge can be in one political subdivision unless a, uh, a treaty is established between the two Grand Lodges. Prince Hall and the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma, we have such a treaty, recognizing each other and allowing each other to coexist. Well, rather than doing this, it was decided that the Grand Lodges needed to merge back. Well, Indian Territory didn't want to give up their identity. Oklahoma Territory didn't want to give up their identity. So a decision was made that Oklahoma, instead of has two Grand Lodges, which meet as one. And if you turn on into proceedings, let me grab a proceedings. On one of the pages, at, the, at, the, at one of the plates at the beginning, every Grand, Lot, Grand Proceeding since has stated, like this one, this is for the year 1997. This is the 124th annual communication of the Grand Lodge of Indian Territory, the 105th annual communication of the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma Territory, and the 89th communication of the Grand Lodge of the state of Oklahoma. What we do is we have two Grand Lodges that meet as one, as a third Grand Lodge. And right now we're up to 147 years for the Grand Lodge of Indian Territory, 120 for the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma Territory, and 110 for the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma as of 2020. H.L. Muldrow was elected to be the last Grand Master of Indian Territory. And he was also the first Grand Master of the state of Oklahoma. Now Indian Territory had, do y'all understand what I, I say when I mean we were a dry state? That means that we, there was no alcohol. If you wanted a drink, it was bootleg, it was illegal. And that was, um, was in Indian territory, was dry, but Oklahoma territory was wet. So there was a lot of bootlegging that went across the Canadian River, which was the, the border at that time. And um, if you were uh, caught bootlegging and you were a Mason, you were expelled for unmasonic conduct. Well, Indian territory had a, um, a lodge called Darty Lodge that paid for its building with two uh, kegs of beer. And if you, uh, I'd like to conclude this talk by telling y'all the story of Darty Lodge. This brother was brother J.C. Hutchins. He was a former U.S. Deputy Marshal. He was also a secretary of Darty Lodge number 33 in Darty, Oklahoma. And this is a letter that he wrote while living in the old Confederate home in Ardmore, Oklahoma. If you were a Confederate, at that time, if you were a Confederate veteran, there was uh, old folks homes that was established for the veterans. And this letter was written to the Grand Lodge to document the history of Darty Lodge. We had no lodge room at Darty, but we had a lodge number 33. Hardy and Frost built a rock building. Now Hardy and Frost was a, um, were members 
but they were grocers. They had a, a dry goods store. I was secretary of the lodge and they requested that if we could build a second story for the lodge room, I put it up to the lodge for action. It was voted on and unanimously carried. It was one of the best deals I'd ever pulled. I got busy and we built it as secretary. And at our first meeting, I read the bills, $2,170, amount in the treasury, $1.75. What a how went up. I placed a motion before the house that the body authorized me as secretary to use the seal of the lodge as security so that we could borrow any money on the face of the earth that I could. Again, the members set up a howl and voted me down. They said, let the Grand Lodge pay for it. Well, there was nothing doing that night. So the next meeting night, we had the worst storms come up and only my friends, attended the lodge. Now, do you guys do that where uh, if you got something critical going on, you just hope that your buddies show up to vote for it? So um, luck was with me for the motion carried and I was to get the money any way I could. I proceeded to Ardmore, which is a town about 30 miles away from Darty, and embraced my old friend, brother A.G. Wolverton with a long face and talked to him about letting me have the money. I went right back to Darty. Now, Brother Warvington was an oil man. He had a lot of money at the time. So I went back to Darty with the loan and paid off everything we owned. Of course, all these busybodies wanted to know how I did it, but I played deaf and dumb and just let them guess. Work was scarce that year, and we failed to meet the note when it came due. I went, I was, I went down to see Brother Warburton, expecting, of course, that he would renew the note. And he said, I'm sorry, brother, I have to have the money. I thought I would sink clear through the chair. After letting me sweat a little, he said, I tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a letter of credit and you go to Colonel Slaughter at the Red River National Bank in Gainesville, Texas. <coughs> Maybe he can help you because I definitely need this money right now. In fact, I have to have it. I advance that money to you on the strength of masonry and the seal of the lodge, and I've got to have it right away. He turned from his desk and wrote the president of the Red River Bank a letter of credit. I got on the train and went down there. I met with Brother Slaughter and he handed me the check and it seemed to amuse him, but he laughed and laughed heartily and said, I think I can help you. He made out the note, signed it for a draft and took it to Wolverton with a big smile. Well, to make a long story short, I shuffled back between Red River Bank and Brother Wolverton for five years, back and forth. Borrowing from first one and paying off the other with the money. Basically, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Then one year, I arrived in Gainesville, and here comes my buddy, the bootlegger. And, it's, and I'm going, hmm, maybe we can work something out here. Old Haley. Haley Russell and myself had been barefoot kids together, and at one time had been, he had been a mason until he got into the wholesale whiskey business. Then he was expelled for unmasonic conduct. I told him what was going on and that we still hold $1,662, the original amount, and it just didn't look though we were ever gonna get out of debt. I wished I could help you, he said, but every cent of money I have is tied up in my liquor stocks. Now, at this time, he was in Gainesville, Texas, and Texas was a wet state. They, they had alcohol, so he wasn't bootlegging in Texas. All at once, it hit me. Only I said, you know, President Grover Cleveland is coming to town, don't you? President? Of course, I know who he is, but he's coming to Darty. Well, he's going to visit Darty Lodge Saturday evening, and he wrote to tell me, could you get me six kegs of beer? 
Well, I'm sure I do it on. I can do it on the next train. <laughs> I saw to it that I was on the same train as the beer. And when we both landed at Darty at the same time as Deputy U.S. Marshal, I seized every bit of it as soon as it was taken off the train. It went into the front door of my office and out the back door. And I stored it until I could get a court order to have it destroyed. But when it went out the back door, I reported to the US court that my office had been broken into and the beer stolen and made it stick. I notified by the grapevine, horseback and news spreaders that we would hold an old time reunion Saturday evening at 2 p.m. And all Masons in good standing were invited. Poor old George Fraser, and you should have seen the congregation. Poor old Ch George Fraser got next, and he finished a sandwich. And believe me, this old world, at least for a while, looked level again. Of course, they kept their beer hidden from me, for I was supposed to be looking for it. I knew a number of fellas, 12 or 15, sitting cross-legged old cowboy style. I knew each one of them had a schooner or beer piece. So I stepped away in for a few minutes and came back and then walked over to him. You boys seem to be having a good time. We sure are, Marshal, they replied. I, rem I remember three of them spoke up at the same time with the same words, Bud Young, Bill Martin, and John Hodgson's. I looked at him and I says, brother, is this good time worth $100 to you? Sure, they answered me. Well, then start kicking in. And when I walked away from that bunch, I had $1,500 $1, in checks. I worked several more groups the same way and got checks from all of them, but not one of them paid $100 a piece. Every Mason knew where the money was going, and it would just pay off that old note. Well, I left them to their joy, and I'm telling you that we, they sure paid their respects to me. From what I heard afterwards, I looked back and I could see the blue smoke pouring out the windows, but I didn't care. I had their checks and I was on the way to the bank to cash them. Even today, my old great haired and bootlegging deed was according to the will of my Lord. And with that, a lodge was paid for with six kegs of beer. And gentlemen, I'll open the floor to questions. I, uh, I enjoy I enjoyed speaking with you, so let's open it up for questions and take it from there, Brother Gordon. Brother Donnie Higginbottom, thank you so much for a, a very interesting uh, look at the history of your state where you come from and uh, the, the lovely story there about the kegs of beer. Uh, as most of our visitors on the, the call this evening know that I'm, I'm, I abstain from the, the drinking of the alcohol myself, you see. So I don't really know what you're talking about, kegs of beer. And I can see them all laughing at me now, Donnie, because that's as far from the truth as you can get, particularly after <laughs> yesterday's visit to the, the public house to watch Scotland's humiliation at the soccer, as you would call it. But that's another story. Uh, but what a wonderful and lovely story uh, to, to round that off. Uh, about the kegs of beer, Donnie. Thank you. I'm sure we will have some questions in the, the, the chat room, Vern. Uh, please fire them in for me. Uh, and let's have a, a quick look there. I uh, think Ron's having computer problems again. Uh, Paul loved it. Thank you. It's uh, great. Come on, Bren. I'm sure you, your computers haven't all frozen up with your questions. Uh, it's always a good sign when there's no questions as well, Donnie, because you've done such a good job. You well, see. either that or I put them all to sleep. Uh, no, definitely not to sleep, you see. Uh, I, I do monitor them and uh, give them a little kick if they are sleeping. Um, so Ian Kennedy asks, were there any First Nation Masons? Yes. Yes, there were. Um, John Ross was the principal chief of, uh, of the Cherokee Nation. He was a Mason. Most of the of the principal chiefs were Masons, uh, having taken their degrees back east. Okay, thank you. I someone's been nosy about your family history. 
what did your great granddaddy run from the law for? Uh, my great granddaddy was a Confederate soldier and his dad was a Confederate soldier and they were slaveholders uh, and just point blank period. And my great grandfather was in Dallas, Texas. He was, uh, even to the day he died, he was an, a mean man. And uh, he uh, killed a, a black man in Dallas, Texas. Black, just he killed him. Uh, the black man had the audacity to walk in front of him. And him being a, an ex slaveholder didn't see the, uh, the humor in it and killed him. Mm, tragic. Change yeah. days. Well, well uh, some God. some would some would still argue that there's still challenges, but uh... well, you know, uh, it's kind of funny. My great grandfather killed a black man. When I was Grand High Priest, I signed the uh, the mutual recognition with Prince Hall, Grand Chapter Royal Arch Masons, and um, so yeah, we've come a long way over the over the hundred years. Yeah, we, we were uh, privileged to have uh, Oscar Allen present to us a, a few months ago about the history of Prince Hall Grand Lodge uh, as yes. well, because that's something that we, we don't have over here. Uh, Brother Ian Walk asks about the First Nation, uh, Brian, what volume of the Sacred Law did they use? Uh, they used the Holy Bible. The, the majority of the uh, Indian, the natives, were either, while they would practice their own native religion, they also professed to be Christians. And the, so there was a high percentage of Christians in, in the, uh, the native. Understand that the, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, Muscogee Creek, Seminole, they were, they had adopted the white man's ways. The, they just had their own nations, but they had adopted. That's why we called them the civilized tribes is they had adopted the, the ways of the American uh, colonies uh, or states as they are now. And uh, so they were very much Christian. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one of our past masters, Alan Turton, that was super, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Michael Monroe, our brother who's out in Paris, France. Did the Oklahoma land race spread lodges throughout the state? Okay, say that again, sir. Did the Oklahoma land race spread lodges through the state? Yes and no. The, uh, the land runs, they, they did by creating new towns. And so once you had new towns, then you would have a new lodge come in. Uh, but as far as founding the lodges the day of the uh, of the run, not really. Uh, it was more of a down the road thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sandy Thompson asks, was Billy Joe McAllister of Choctaw Ridge fame a Freemason? Uh, Billy Joe McAllister, no, the Choctaw Ridge was in is in Mississippi, which is the the traditional homes of the Choctaw tribe. And uh, Billy Joe McAllister would, was, um, is a, to the best of my knowledge, a work of fiction. And he would not have been a Mason considering the age that he was at the time he committed suicide. Okay, thank you. I've never heard of Billy Joe McAllister, so that's one for Mr. Google this evening. Thanks, Sandy. Um, Gerard uh, O'Donnell asks, how many active Masons do you have in your Grand Lodge today? And what was the number when the, the Grand Lodge was at its most active? Uh, the Grand Lodge has, we have around 20,000 active Masons in the whole state. Uh, when we were uh, our most active in the, in the 40s, 50s and 60s, it was up around uh, 100,000 to the best of my knowledge. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brother Ron Mann asks, uh, or he states, Mississippi is a long river. Yep, I think we, we see that on the map. But he asks, where did the crossing of the Indians take place? Uh, in various places. Um, Memphis was one uh, to cross the Mississippi, what is now meant, uh, the city of Memphis. There were, they were ferried across the river. Uh, if they come up through the Kentucky Trail, 
they would have come up through what uh, ferried around St. Louis. If they come up through Tennessee, they would have been ferried over at Mississippi or at uh, Memphis. And then if they were ferried, if they come up through Mississippi, then they would have been ferried in at uh, Vicksburg. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vicksburg Meridian area. Joe Priest asks, as there are two Grand Lodges that meet as one, is that the same for the Royal Arch? And I would imagine for other appendant orders. Actually, the what we call the York Rite, which is the Royal Arch, the, uh, the Council, and the Commandery, the Royal Arch did split, but we, were, we reunited as one. The Commandery never split. The, the Knights Templar never split. And uh, no one cares about the council. No, I'm I'm kidding about that. <laughs> the uh, the council uh, it it split also. But no, we do not. When we just reunited as one. Okay, thank you. And I, I think that's one of the other main differences that we see from between a uh, British Freemasonry or uh, Scottish English Irish Freemasonry and American Freemasonry is the two sizes. You you've got your your York Rite and your ancient accepted. I uh, got the, the other other arm. Uh, Eagle. And I heard it's a lot harder to get a thirty second over there than it is here. But it's a lot harder to get your eighteenth as well. And uh, yeah. the, I think then to, if you're invited to get, to get your eighteenth in your local area, it's a great honour for and it's time served and. It's time served for the 30th, and again, for your 31st and 32nd, uh, it very much is time served, and very, very few uh, get the great honour of the 33rd. I'm uh, I am the director of the 18th at my Scottish Rite, and uh, it's a beautiful degree, and and even even though we'll do, uh, do it in two days, all the way to 32nd, it's an honour to become an 18th degree mason. I will agree to that. I, Eagle from uh, Newfoundland, excellent presentation. Uh, Tom Edgar, uh, very enjoyable and interesting. Thank you. Uh, Michael Monroe has a, another question. Uh, uh, well, it's a question to me, Michael, as well. Uh, but Michael talks about him being at a meeting in Lancashire when there was a visit of the Oklahoma Indian Degree Team. Uh, and the degree was the making of a Master Mason. And I know that you and I and Nobby talked on this before everyone else joined us this evening, Donnie. Would you like just to give a few words about the Oklahoma Indian degree team, please? If, um, if you ever get the chance, the opportunity to go see the Indian degree team, do it. It's well worth your while. They, uh, they use the Oklahoma ritual. Every one of them is what we call an A certificate lecturer. That means they know all of the esoteric work word perfect. They do, um, they ham it up a bit. When, um, when King Solomon is, is uh, has them up and vile and impetuous wretches, you have killed your best friend. Uh, one of the times I saw them uh, as the, the, they were marching out to go with the 12 fellow craft, marching out to go search for the ruffians, one of them looked at, you know, I think he is a little bit upset. They do things like that to just add humor to it, to make it worth the, the while. It's one thing to see a Master Mason degree. It's another thing to see a Master Mason degree in Native Amer American uh, outfits where the guys enjoy doing their work and they have a blast. Um, another thing they'll do is they, they United States is very proud of our flag. And we present our flag before we do anything, pretty much. And we'll have the, the they'll come in doing their stomp dances and present the flag to the East. And it's it's great, it's, it's just wonderful. There's a lot of things that they those guys do. They're, uh, they're champion stomp dancers, but most and foremost, they're brothers. They are our brothers, and um, they do great work. Oh, they are you. our ambassadors of goodwill for the state of Oklahoma. 
I think that they, they have been over to Scotland uh, in previous years. And I think some of our brand have actually seen them. And we've certainly have stories in some of our uh, Masonic magazines about the, their sojourns across uh, the, the pond to the UK. Uh, I know one year when uh, Ronnie Coppage was uh, Grand Master, they went to the UK. And, and Ronnie went, most worshipful Coppage went with them for a few days just to, to be with them. And uh, everyone said that they were welcomed and felt like they were at home. Yeah. I, I think the, the Scots have got a, uh, some distant connection there, the similarities with our clan system and the, the nation system as well, uh, going back. Uh, John Cameron comments in Canada lodges followed the railroad uh, that also makes a great deal of sense as, it, as you sojourned west very interesting and funny talk haste you back uh, I think that's to do with the beer at the end David Yeah. Uh, Alan Turton asks is Freemasonry on the way back in Oklahoma and I think that's in terms of the numbers and the popularity and yes. The... yes it is um, we're going we're trying to introduce ourselves to the young men. Um, people my age, I'm 62. And if the good Lord grants me, I've got maybe another 20 years. I might make my 50 years. I'm 35 in, I might make 50. But we're going, uh, we have an organization called DMLA, which is for our young men, uh, young men ages 11 to 21 can join DMLA. And it is basically... Uh, we teach them our Masonic truths and teach them how to be, try to help them become, become men. Uh, the old Saxon mon, uh, you know, one of good worth, one of good value. And I've been, I was a DMLA advisor for many years. And out of that, we, about half of the boys uh, wind up becoming Masons. So that's one of the aspects we're doing. Our grandmaster has a Facebook program going on right now, so that um, I believe it's called Be a Mason Oklahoma. It's the website, and what it's doing is we're getting a lot of questions from the Grand Lodge Facebook page about masonry. Well, they've designed a list of questions, and if you answer these questions the right way, then they will find a lodge in your area and send your contact information to that lodge. So that way uh, we're, we're bringing in members that way. And, That's a really interesting may, idea. And if I may, Brother Kerr, your name, Robert Kerr, is very important in Oklahoma and in Indian and in, uh, in the United States history. Uh, Robert Kerr was born in my hometown of Ada, Oklahoma. He was a poor farm boy who got into the oil business and founded, helped found Kerr McGee Oil Company. But he went on to become governor of the state of Oklahoma and was elected to the U.S. Senate, where he became the majority leader of the Senate. And the best way to describe the majority leader, if you don't know Oklahoma or United States politics, is he's basically the prime minister of the Senate. And he worked with President uh, John Kennedy was when he was the, uh, the, prime, the prime minister. He was the majority leader, was a very powerful man, did a lot of great for Oklahoma. Having grown up in the Dust Bowl, he was very much into water and to saving our water. And he was able to get all kinds of legislation through at the federal level which built water conservation ponds in the state of Oklahoma to the point that Oklahoma has more miles of shoreland than the East Coast of the United States. So when I saw your name pop up, I just, I just had to tell you that story. Bob Kerr was a, a very important man in this history of Oklahoma. There you go, Robert. You've got a namesake over in Oklahoma. It's doing great work. <laughs> And uh, thank, thanks for that, Donnie. Lovely little story. I, another question around uh, 
post-COVID, some of the US Grand Lodges we hear have started to open up. Uh, is this true for your Grand Lodge? Okay, we've done what now? Has the, the Lodges started meeting again after COVID? Oh, God, yes. Oh, yes. Oklahoma is wide open. Uh, there are no restrictions um, on, in the state of Oklahoma. Um, we, uh, we've been opened up now. The, the Grand Master released his edict of um, lockdowns um, about two months ago, about the same time the governor of Oklahoma released, released all, edict, um, all restrictions. Well, that's good news. We are still waiting uh, on changes to happen here in Scotland and in the, the rest of the UK, Donny. Uh, so that's good news for you. Uh, a, a couple of uh, comments. Very enjoyable presentation. Thank you. Very enjoyable lecture. Thank you, Brother Higginbotham. Uh, Aubrey Winnie down in Chile asks, what is a stomp dance? Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a dancer. So I, I couldn't do a demonstration, but it's literally they stomp uh, in time with the music. And it's usually done in a circle around a fire pit. Um, and and they, they sing their prayers while they're doing, doing the stomp dance. Uh, they oh, yeah. have uh, jingles on them, which... Uh, you know, it's it's really something to see. Uh, I, a bit of a mixture of Morris dancing and Highland dancing and everything flung in the in the middle. Uh, Closest I could say it comes to is Irish dancing, where they have the stiff upper body and they only only move the the feet. Uh, except you'll never get an, an a native stiff upper body here. They they're into it. They they get into it. <laughs> Fantastic. I, uh, I, would, I would hope that they don't dance around a fire pit in the lodges. <laughs> uh, Robert Clarker, immediate past master and acting secretary. Excellent lecture. Very enjoyable. I had the pleasure of seeing the Oklahoma Indian degree team in Delaware some years ago. Uh, it must have been when he was a, a boy sailor. Uh, and over 3,000 Brown were present in the university sports arena with state troopers directing traffic wearing their aprons. That must have been some sight. I, I can believe it. I can definitely believe it. I, Ron Mann comments in Canada, the Indian tribes are called clans, not tribes. Uh, uh, are degrees in the native Grand Lodge in English or in the native language? They're in Oki. Yes, they're in English. Uh, well, a form of English. It's uh, Oklahoma English, but it's English. Fantastic. Brother Donny Higginbotham, thank you so much for answering those uh, questions that have been posed this evening. It's been a great pleasure having you here. Uh, I think we, we've all watched True Grit as well uh, over over many years and even the, the, the remake of it more recently. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, we've seen the beautiful lands that, that you live in nowadays. Uh, and uh, I think for many of us, it's a bucket list place to maybe get to see at some point. Uh, but on behalf of everyone here at the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337 and our lockdown lecture and all our guests uh, this evening, can I thank you so much for a, you, a valuable lesson that you've given us today in helping us make our daily advancement in Masonic knowledge. Thank you. It was my honor. And, uh, and I, I uh, look forward to hope, hopefully someday doing this again with you, brother. But, my, but next time, I'd like to do it in your lodge with all of y'all there. You'd be more than welcome. I uh, very much Appreciate so. Thank you, brother. Mm. Thank you, sir. Brian, next week, I, we have uh, brother Alexander Herbert coming to speak to us uh, about the book he's written recently and published on Lodge Liberté Cherie. And that is the lodge that was formed in the prisoner of war camp uh, by under the Grand Lodge of Belgium. Uh, unlike the majority of our speakers, due to uh, the some of the, the publishment, publishing agreements he's got with the family members, he's requested that we don't record next week's presentation uh, because he's been shared a lot of personal uh, 
memorabilia from those prisoner of war and I think we can rightly understand why. So Brian, I would encourage you, we only have a, a limit of 100 and we know most weeks we, we're 60 plus. Uh, so it is first come first serve next week, Brian. Uh, so please uh, be here because I'm sure that will be a, a very moving presentation. Brian, uh, at this time, uh, can I Thank you once again for supporting us every week and please now unmute and say your own personal thank yous to Brother Donny Higginbotham. Thanks, Donny. That was an excellent lecture. Thank you, Brother Donny. Donny, you mentioned St. Louis and Memphis. That's the whole length of Mississippi. How did they coordinate the crossings? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I could barely hear you, Brother. Gordon, could you? Yeah, I, Donnie, what Ron's asking, I, the, the staging posts on the Mississippi that you mentioned is basically from south to north. And Ron's East question is, how did they uh, coordinate the crossings? Well, they had troops. These, these people were not walking and just told, go east, go west and go. They were escorted by troops. Matter of fact, they were rounded up by troops and they were marched. And the, their, when they would get to a ferry point, you know, they would load up as many people as they could put on a ferry and shoot it across the river. And then once uh, with the troops guarding, at that time, they were basically prisoners of war on a forced march. That's the, that's the best way to describe it. Okay, thank you. Don't, is that, have, go ahead. I was going, Ron, does that answer your question? Yeah, basically when, when uh, Donnie mentions prisoners of war, because if you take the length of the Mississippi, we all know it's long, but he just mentioned a few places in his lecture, and when, like, I've been to St. Louis, I've been to Memphis, I've been down there, that's a long way, and I was just wondering how they coordinated the crossings to get all the Indians across the same time. I don't think it would have been at the same time, Ron. I think it was just over the over those many years, and uh, a great military exercise, no doubt. And uh, yes, the, the trail of tears. The, the trail of tears started in Georgia mm -hmm. and ended in Oklahoma. It started on the east coast, uh, Georgia, South Carolina. Florida for the Seminoles. Uh, the, the Florida Pence Peninsula is rather long. It's a full day's drive uh, to, to go from Miami to, the, to Orlando. So these people had to walk and it took, it took years, it took many years. And depending upon the routes you took was based upon where you come from. Uh, the primary uh, the primary crossing point was actually St. Louis area, was where the primary crossing point was. The, the trail, a lot of the trail basically went from, if you got up on Georgia, you go up through the t middle Tennessee, kind of through Nashville, come back down, you and then it come down into Arkansas, and then from Arkansas, it, ca uh, it came in. The primary crossing was the St. Louis area. But they also had crossings in Mississippi and in Tennessee. Okay, thank uh, you, Donnie. Thousands of miles. Yeah. Yeah. Brenna, I will put some further information on the Facebook pages about the Trail of Tears this evening, because uh, I think it is a, a, an interesting uh, part of this evening's presentation. Uh, Brian, but I'll fling the floor back open to you to say your thank yous and your good evenings to, to Donnie. Thank you, Brian. Donnie, thank you very much. That was an absolutely brilliant, uh, brilliant and interesting lecture. Really appreciate it. Thank you very yeah, much. That was excellent, Donnie. Really Looking time. forward to the next one in person, hopefully. Hopefully. Excellent. Oh, Donnie, thank you very much. That was most enjoyable this evening. Thank you, brother. Donnie, thank you, Donnie. Thank you very much. Very well presented, Donnie. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Thank, thank you, brother Donnie. 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 I thoroughly enjoyed that. It was very entertaining, very informative, and I do appreciate the work that you've put into it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much for your very, very informative <laughs> lecture, Donnie. Thanks very much. Well done. To all concerned. <clears throat> I'm thank sorry, sir. Much. Brother Donnie, thank you very much. As everybody said, very interesting, very informative, and 
with an iceberg candy thrown in at the end. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Write a book on it, Worshipful. Write a book on it, Johnny. It'll sell well. Very excellent uh, presentation, uh, Donny, brother Donny. Thank you. Yourself, Donny. And I'll give you five, Brian. Thank, Thank you, brother. You, brother. And all overseas, uh, uh, whether you, you're uh, on the Americas, uh, Canada, <coughs> and Scotland, of course. Donny, thank you very, very much. That was wonderful. Thank and you. And for Bern. Thank you, thank you Donny. That's uh, thank you. a presentation. Thank you. Well done, brother Donny. Very, very, very well researched and excellent pre presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother David. Well done, Gordon. Cheers, David. And three, Bern. Thank you, brother Gordon. And Donny, totally enjoyed it. Thank you, brother Kerr. Nice yeah. slide there. Thank you very much, Gordon. Thank you. And two, Brian. Yeah, very good. Thank you, gentlemen. And one, Brian. Man, the crowd is getting smaller. <laughs> we give them a countdown, Donny. That, that's what happens. And then there's a few of them realise there's a little after party that we're about to go to. So, Brian, Brother Donny Higginbotham, once again, on behalf of uh, the Lodge Hope of Karachi Lockdown Lecture, thank you so much, sir. And, Brian, that is the recording. Uh,